But here's the big question. How do you get a renewed mind? You know, the Bible tells us to renew your mind. How do you get a renewed mind? Well, my answer is very simple. Here it is. Would you open up to Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12. And as always, I read from the New King James Version of Scripture. Uh, This uh, morning and next week, we're going to continue on with the series of uh, defeating that spirit of fear or any other spirit, but living in victory. And so the title of my message this morning is Living in Victory. I don't know if we understand that when God gave us free will, and and this is the big point that I really need for you to get. When God gave us free will, he gave us free will not to do whatever we want to do. Isn't that strange? Well, why would you give somebody free will? Well, he gave us free will in order for us to choose freely his will. And I'm, and I'm not sure that people fully understand that, that, uh, that when we are given free will, God wants us to understand that he's a good God and the best way to live life is aligning ourselves with the will of God. And until we understand that, we all want to do our own thing. But our own thing has been impacted by our worldview and what other people say to us and what other people think and all these influences that impact our lives. How many of you are parents? How many of you know that as parents, one of the things that you try to do is protect your people from the influence of bad people because your young people are constantly being influenced to make various decisions. And so here's the big thought. The big thought is if you want to live your best life with free will, choose to do God's will. That's the big thought. And and in order to do that, our mind needs to accept that as the big thought. But the problem is that our mind is constantly being impacted by, by influences on the outside. And there's... You know, the Bible talks about something called worldliness. It used to be a very popular topic many, many years ago. And uh, it's not become a very popular topic now. So we've redefined it as worldview. So let's talk about worldview and the worldly worldview. As, and uh, the opposite to that is God's view and understanding what God believes and and choosing that. And so here it is, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. In other words, do not be influenced by worldliness. Do not let this world's worldview get into your spirit, into your mind, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here it is, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so what we have in this verse is the alignment of a renewed mind aligns itself with the perfect, acceptable will of God. And so we have this alignment of When your mind has been renewed, you will pursue the will of God for your life. But here's the big question. How do you get a renewed mind? You know, the Bible tells us to renew your mind. How do you get a renewed mind? Well, my answer is very simple. Here it is. The only way we can get a renewed mind is to fill it with the word of God. Problem is that our mind is being filled with so much stuff that the Word of God is almost put in the background. I did some research on how often people read the Word of God. Are you ready? This is a Pew, um, the Pew Research Academy did some research. I think they, they interviewed 35,000 people to get the statistic. And this is what they found. They found that 35% 
of people read their Bible at least once a week. Once a week. And they consider that good. Once a week. Then they found out that 10% of people read their Bible once or twice a month. 8% several times a year. And here it is, 45% of people seldom or never read the Word of God. 45% seldom or never. You say, John, are you putting a guilt trip on us? No, no, I'm not putting a guilt trip on you. I'm answering the question, how do you get a renewed mind? And I'm saying to you, the only way that we can get a renewed mind is through understanding, reading, imbibing, reflecting, allowing the Word of God to get into our spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.26, about the church of God, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And so what Paul is saying in Ephesians 5.26 is that if we want to be cleansed, if we want to be righteous, if we want our minds to be unpolluted and cleansed, then the word of God is like a washing, a cleansing. And it's really sad when when 35% of people only get a cleansing once a week and we think that's good. It's like the person next to you, did they have a shower today? or, Well, actually, well, that was a week ago. But then there's 10% that only have a shower twice a month at the most, 8% just a few times a year, and 45% hardly ever take a shower. <laughs> That puts a different slant on that, doesn't it? If reading the word is like washing ourselves. And so and so here's the point. The point is that every single day we are being influenced by a worldly worldview. Every single day our mind is being bombarded by thoughts, by precepts, by concepts, just bombing us, bombing us, bombing us. And unless we're able to filter those thoughts through the word of God, We will be influenced. Our mind will be influenced. It will not be conformed to the Word of God. It will be conformed to this world and the thoughts of the people around us. And by all of the logic that they use, it will be conformed. And so the big battle that we face for our young people is the bombardment they receive from all of the secular worldviews. And it's creating their worldview. And... Something's got to happen where we start to encourage people. Can you get into the Word of God? Can you, can you get this Bible into you? I remember as a little kid memorizing Psalm 119 verse 9. Psalm 119, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. And I remember that being a foundation in my life. I, 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 want, I want a clean life. I want it. I, and how do you do that? By just getting the word of God, taking heed to the word of God. And Jesus' prayer, the high priestly prayer, the night before his crucifixion is found in John 17. And he's praying for the church and he's saying, God, would you sanctify them by your truth? And then he makes this classic statement, your word is truth. Your word is truth. See, our Christian worldview is this, that our truth is not determined by this world, but our truth is determined by God's word. And what I find is that the truth of this world changes. It constantly changes. But the truth of God's word never changes. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word that he has spoken will fall short. So that's the big thought. Can I just open it up a little bit by saying this? Our biggest battle is the battle of the mind. Everybody say the battle of the mind. The battle of the mind is the biggest battle that we face. The battle of the mind, parents, is the biggest battle you face with your young people. The battle of the mind. The battle that we all face is the battle of the mind. 
And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that the God of this world has blinded people's minds. And the God of this world, satanic forces are at work to blind people from the truth of God's word. And seriously, if you're going to listen to the media, you're going to listen to a whole bunch of people who've been blinded from God's truth. You're going to listen to the news all the time. It's been filtered. There's, there's true news. There's fake news. But all of it goes through filters. It was so interesting. Last night I was watching um, just the results of The Voice. And um, I turned to the ABC and, and was listening to them. And it was like, oh, my goodness, every thought that they're speaking is filtered through the whole worldview of the ABC. And, uh, and it's like, oh my goodness, that is so clear to me that, that their worldview is this. And, uh, and everything that they present is this. And it goes through their filter. You have to be so aware of the filters that your information is coming through. Because if you believe those filters, then you will be influenced and your mind will follow that. But when we consider that 45% of people seldom will never read the word of God, how can, how can we say that people in our world have a renewed mind? And, and I'm shocked at the responses that I hear when people are in stress and in strife, that what comes out of their mouth is fear and intimidation and negativity rather than God's got this, you know, God's on my side. We're going to win regardless because a renewed mind is tested when you're under pressure. And you want to know if your mind is renewed? What do you say when you're under pressure? What do you say when you're confronting a giant? What do you say when you are confronting a huge obstacle? Because a renewed mind will always say, God's got this. God's on my side. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to, I'm going to believe that God will make a way where there is no way. So we can sing the songs on Sunday. We, we can, and that's a beautiful thing to sing the songs, but the true test is not the song that you sing on Monday, but the response of your heart when you're facing your giant, when you're facing your trial. The battle of the mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, that the weapons of our warfare, well, verse 4 says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And then in verse 5, it talks about what those strongholds are, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That word arguments, casting down arguments, is the Greek word Logismos. And we get our English word logic, thinking, reasoning out of this. So what Paul is saying is that the biggest warfare we face is the warfare of the mind. What we're thinking. And, and Paul then says that one of the things that we've got to pull down is anything that rises itself above the knowledge of God. And so as Christians, we want a renewed mind our mind needs to be aligned with God, his word. And that's what gives us victory in life. And the only way we can get this victory is to fill ourselves with the word of God. Please, don't be one of those people that rarely reads the word of God. Please, I, 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 I'm just shocked at, the, at, at some of the statistics that I'm hearing. We were at State Conference last week. Um, once a year, all of the Australian Christian churches of New South Wales gather together and we have a conference. And at this conference, Andy Kirk, who's the, the kids leader for the Australian Christian Churches of Australia, gave some statistics uh, that he gained from a, um, a survey that was done called Global Youth Culture. And uh, if you want to look at the survey, just go to ACC Kids and the whole survey is there. But he was saying that in this survey, they discovered this, that to go from nominal Christian to committed Christian, 
You just got to believe four things. You got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for our sins, that He rose again, and that the Bible is the Word of God. You believe those four things and do two things. And here it is the two things. Talk about a low bar. Pray once a week and read the Bible once a week. And if you believe those four things, pray once a week, read the Bible once a week, you go from nominal Christian to committed Christian. Just by believing four things and reading the Bible once a week and praying once a week. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So that's the definition of a committed Christian. But does every committed Christian have a renewed mind? And I'm proposing to you today that there's a lot of committed Christians that don't have a renewed mind. There's a lot of committed Christians that in times of stress throw their hands in the air and run rather than stand their ground, look the enemy in the face and say, God is for me. Who can be against me? Who are you to stand against a child of God? I've got God on my side. God and me make a majority. I'm going to speak to the sea. Open up and it'll open up. I'm going to say to this giant, you're coming down. Why? Because my mind is renewed. I'm able to resist temptation. I'm able to go through under the power of God. And this is something that we've, we, we, we've got to do. Second thing I want to say is this. Our most important Christian goal is to have the mind of Christ. Please, don't just make your goal getting to heaven. It's a good goal to have, incidentally, because it beats the alternative. Can anybody say amen to that? It certainly beats the alternative. But if your salvation is just, I I just want to get to heaven, then the best thing we can do after you get saved is shoot you. That's it. Because then there's no backsliding. You get straight to heaven. But how many of you know that's not God's will? God's will for you now that you're saved is so much bigger. And the first thing that he wants you to do now that you're saved is to have the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Galatians 4.19 says, I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. So once you get saved, God's goal is that you might become like Jesus, have the mind of Christ, do life as Jesus did it. And as a church, we call that discipleship. And so for those of you that are here for the first time, this is a discipleship message. This is one of those messages where you really clap, you say a lot of ouch, and you say, oh, my goodness, because discipleship messages are always tough messages. And it's interesting how in these latter days, too many people have developed a taste for entertaining preaching rather than inspirational, touching points where we need to change type preaching. And we need more of that if we want to become true disciples of Christ. The mind of Christ. We need the mind of Christ. How do we get the mind of Christ? The Word of God. The Word of God. Imbibing the word of God. The more word you have in you, the more you will become like Jesus. The less word you have in you, the more you will be like the world. And we've got so many Christians fighting worldly ideologies in their mind, worldly battles, because they haven't got enough of the word in them. I want to encourage you today to make a commitment as of this day. A day will not go past without me getting into the word of God. I don't care if you just do three minutes. You know, I'm not asking you to do hours on end, just even a few minutes, but you're meditating on the word. You're reflecting on the word. I enjoy doing it first thing in the morning. Anne enjoys doing it last thing at night before she goes to bed. And so she's meditating on it as she sleeps. I love to wake up in the morning and meditate on it through the whole day. That's the way we operate. And we're different. You need to find some time that's suitable to you, but make sure that every single day you're washing yourself with the Word, washing yourself with the Word of God, washing yourself with the Word of God. The mind of Christ removes the blindness from our eyes. We begin to see what God sees. Our worldview is transformed. 
then our decisions become impacted by what we believe. Every decision you make is connected to what you really believe, not what is at the forefront, but what's behind, because every decision is connected to a belief system. When our mind is renewed, we're able to move into the decisions that God wants for our mind because our mind is connected to the Word of God. It's as simple as that. And you will only really know when the pressure is on. When the pressure is on, what you really believe comes to the surface. When the pressure is on, I'm I'm shocked at how many people lose their faith or how many people start swearing or how many people start cursing or how many people start blaming God. I I love it when the pressure is on and you see sweetness come out and, and people stating, you know what, God's with me, God's going to see me through. And that's a real test. And if you know in your heart of hearts that when the test is on, you're one of the people who abandon your faith and run, here it is, my word of encouragement. You need more of the Word of God. You need to set yourself time aside in the Word of God. Get the Word of God into you. You say, John, this is such a basic message. Well, let me move on to the second half of the message. I've only got a few minutes left. But I want to talk about the confrontation of spirits that are out there. And again, you know, for some people, this is real spooky language. But the Bible says that God is spirit. And, and, and the Bible tells us that the enemy is a spirit. And that there are demonic forces that are spirits. And so the Bible actually gives names to, to a whole bunch of different spirits. And I want to name five spirits today that we do battle against. And these spirits have a purpose. We started a few weeks ago with the spirit of fear. And uh, we, we talked about God has not given us a spirit of fear. And we spoke about that spirit. And, uh, but this is the point that that spirit has a purpose. And every spirit that's given a name has a purpose. And that name is connected to what they want to accomplish in your life. What you've got to understand is this, that we do battle against spiritual forces. And if you don't understand that, then they win. Because their biggest triumph over you is when you don't believe that they exist. And what an incredible thing it is in churches all over this world that people don't believe in spiritual forces. And yet... God is spirit, but we don't believe in spiritual forces. We don't believe that there's a spirit realm, and yet God is spirit. How do you you understand that? Well, we understand that this is a spiritual realm. There's a physical realm. There's a spiritual realm. Both are real. Even though we can't see the spiritual realm, we are impacted by the spiritual realm. And, And what Jesus talks about is that the spiritual realm is like a wind. You can't see it, but you can feel it. You can feel its impact. And the same with spiritual forces. You can't see it, but you can feel its impact. So can I share with you five spirits that have purpose? Are you ready? Number one, the spirit of fear. We've already spoken about that. Its purpose is to block you, to intimidate you, to stop you from moving forward. 2 Timothy 1.7. Can I talk to you about another spirit that is incredibly powerful in the world today. Hosea chapter two of chapter four, verse 12, talks about the spirit of harlotry. Can I give you the Greek word in the New Testament for harlotry? It's called pornea. So there's a spirit at play today, which is very strong. It's, it's always been strong. It's always been strong in all generations and all cultures. And it's this spirit of harlotry, sexual immorality. And, and, and the reason for, for this spirit being so strong is that because it wants to pollute that which God has created. Just an incredible thing that, that God has created sexual intimacy within the confines of marriage between a husband and a wife. And that's the boundaries that God has placed. And anything outside of those boundaries is wrong. It's simple. And it connects to the spirit of harlotry. And what we've got to do is confront this spirit with purity. Everybody say purity. Purity is not a dirty word. Harlotry is a dirty word. Purity is a beautiful word because God is pure. God is holy. 
And God expects purity. And within the confines of marriage, sex is pure, sex is beautiful, sex is wonderful. But only within the confines of marriage. Spirit of harlotry. I don't have time to expand on it, but I'm just telling you. It's a spirit that if you want to confront, fill yourself with the word of God. The third spirit that we need to confront in this age is the spirit of heaviness. Everybody say the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 61 verse 3 says that he's going to turn around and, and give them who mourn in Zion beauty for ashes, the joy, the oil of joy for mourning and take away the spirit of heaviness and give them a garment of praise. Can I talk to you about the spirit of heaviness for a little while? Because these spirits come in through an open gate. And and grief is a very common thing that happens to us in life. And there's, there's nothing wrong with grief. Grief is feeling sadness over the loss of something that's very important to us. And, you know, and... Uh, you know, and I was just talking to someone today about their parents getting older and uh, just how there's new lines and, and she had to put a mum into a nursing home and, and there was sadness about that. And that's okay. I get that. There's, there's grief. But the spirit of heaviness is looking for a foothold to grab hold of our lives. And what the spirit of heaviness does it causes us to live in perpetual sadness. And perpetual sadness is not God's will for our life. Yeah, grieve. I I get that. But then be careful of the spirit of heaviness that comes on where you just cannot enjoy anything in life without this constant spirit of weight. And what the spirit of heaviness does, it saps joy. And I'll tell you what else it saps. It saps hope. And hope is what gives us joy. See, for us in the Christian message is that we grieve those who've passed away, but we live in the hope that one day we'll be reunited. We live in the hope that one day God's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. And we balance our grief with hope. But what the spirit of heaviness does steals our hope. And all we do is live in the sadness of loss. The sadness of loss with no hope. And then the spirit of heaviness finds a doorway in. And how sad it is to see people. And you can see them bent over, spiritually bent over, carrying the spirit of heaviness. And it's interesting how the Bible talks about it as a heaviness, a weight. And it saps your energy. It saps your joy. And God says, what do you want? Do you want a spirit of heaviness or a garment of praise? What we try to do here is... Garment of praise upon, because the garment of praise is not heavy. It's joyous. It focuses in on God's the winner. God's the champion. God's on our side. Come on, church. Confront these spirits. Understand they have purpose, and the purpose is to suppress God's plans in your life. Here's another one, spirit of infirmity. What's interesting is that this is one of the spirits that Jesus confronted constantly. In Luke chapter 13, verse 11, It talks about this woman who was bent over for 18 years and she was exposed to a spirit of infirmity. And there's a spirit of sickness and and, uh, it just comes into people's lives. And and there are some people that are constantly sick. They just go from sickness to sickness, sickness of heart, sickness of soul, sickness of body, sickness of mind. It's a spirit. And the purpose of the spirit is just to keep you infirm, keep you sick, keep you just exhausted, keep you focusing in on your sickness rather than the purposes of God for your life. And what we got to do is confront the spirit of infirmity with the gospel. I just say to people, come on, get some gospels in you. You say, what's gospels? The gospel, the word of God. Confront the spirit of infirmity with what God says. He All these infirmities are not coming upon me. Why? Because Jesus died. By his stripes I'm healed. I'm just going to keep confessing the word of God. You say, but John, you're suffering sickness. Yep, but I'm not giving into it. I'm just going to confess by his stripes I'm healed. I'm just going to confess that Jesus took away all of my infirmities, all away my sicknesses, and just keep confessing the gospels, taking every single day 
God's pills. Every, even as the doctor gives you pills to take, go to Dr. Jesus and he'll give you God's pills to take and you work the Word of God, memorize the Word of God, and if you're going to clap, make sure it's a good one for the glory of God. <laughs> the fifth one that I just... And, and again, it's there are so many, but he's five that have really impacted people. Spirit of fear, spirit of harlotry, spirit of heaviness, spirit of infirmity. And the fifth one is the spirit of the Antichrist. Antichrist. You know what the problem is? That some people are looking ahead to the Antichrist without realizing the Antichrist has been at work for 2,000 years. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says... The Antichrist is coming. You've heard that. But the spirit of the Antichrist is here right now. And what's the spirit of the Antichrist? Right there in its name, Antichrist. Against the things of God. Against the things of Christ. Isn't it amazing that for any belief system, you will be defended except when you stand up for Christ. As soon as you stand up for Christ, it's like the spirit of the Antichrist is against anything Christian. You want to stand up for any ideology and we have a phobia that, that, that is given to whatever philosophy you believe in that people are against. But there's no... Have you ever heard of the terminology uh, Christophobia? Huh? Have you ever heard of Christophobia? It doesn't exist. Why is that? Because all the phobias in this world don't believe that there's a phobia against Christ because it's Antichrist. And so you want to confront the spirit of Antichrist? Then get a passion for Christ. It's as simple as that. A passion for Christ. How passionate are you for the things of God? How passionate are you for Jesus? When we say worship the Lord, are your hands still in your pocket and you're looking around and looking at your watch and looking at your phone or your hands lifted up worshiping because your heart's been transformed? I'm for Christ. I'm not anti-Christ. I'm for Christ. One of the phrases that I love in this church is, this is the gathering of the God lovers. Do we have any God lovers in this house? Can you say amen? Can you shout a little bit? Can you clap to God and say, that's who I am. I'm a God lover. I love him. I love his word. I love his church. I love his presence. Hey, do you know what? I have to finish today. But can we do part two next week? <laughs>